very right. All right, is everybody ready to get started? There's a, like a, oh, I think we broke the 20 barrier, so maybe we're ready to start. Uh, my name is Scott Pfeiffer, Director of Product Management at uh, NetApp and owning tech marketing solutions and uh, OEM and business uh, development relationships. Uh, I'm here with Matt Tangvall, he runs our solutions team, and we're going to talk about how to move things from our kind of a proof of concept, um, early advancement in the enterprise into a more of a DevOps deployment. So today you're going to learn a few things that uh, we've been working on and, and hopefully there's some feedback that can help accelerate your deployment of applications. And more importantly, uh, the idea, if the idea resonates in this, make sure we catch up afterwards and, and figure out how to continue to move things farther through the, uh, the process. All right, so we're going to talk about the evolving marketplace. There's a couple of um, analysts out there that talk about different terms here, but it's really the old school versus the, uh, the new school. Maybe it's the David versus Goliath, and Goliath has been out there in traditional SAN platforms. They're focused on resiliency and data protection, and we've been doing this forever, and it's our world. And then there's the David who's like, hey, this is cool. I've got some new stuff, and I, I'm going to change the game a little bit. And IDC calls it the uh, first, second, and third platforms. I think Gardner calls it mode one and mode two. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how that changes between the two, um, the two worlds and how to find ways to, to integrate the two worlds into a more cohesive way to deploy things today. We've got some pretty cool ideas and, and cool applications, but actually deploying them deploying them is really the challenge. So whether you call it a mode one, mode two, or a platform two versus platform three, you can see that most of the growth uh, over the next uh, few years is going to be in this platform three space or third platform. And that is the new economy, the new world, software-defined storage, software-defined everything. And that's, where, that's why we're here, because the rules are changing and we want to accelerate and drive innovation. So that's all goodness. Um, Oops, hit the right way. So if you look at the uh, traditional platform two, this is the SAN group, and there's a few people in, in the uh, room that are in that more traditional storage space. There was a great uh, session earlier today. It was a podcast session, and it's talking about enterprise storage in the ecosystem. And if you get a chance to listen to that, that, it, that actually had some really good conversation around how do you take advantage of the investment for the last 30 years not a commercial for enterprise storage, but it's how do I leverage that investment. Now, if you look at the third platform, the new world, you've got new ways of doing things. It's focused on mobility, quickness uh, of deployment, things to really drive your, your innovation. How do I take something new and bring it in quickly? And I wish we had a third arrow, and I was thinking about putting it in there, but maybe there's a, a 2.5 platform or a mode 1.5, and that is taking this, all this great innovation, the 6,000 people that are here, and marrying that with enterprise storage to create an answer that gives me something that my DevOps team, my IT procurement team, my CIO wants to do today, that they're comfortable doing today. And so that's what we're going to spend the time on. So navigating the data center. Now, sometimes you have a really cool idea, and that idea is something that not everybody's quite bought into yet, but you know it's going to be great. And you got to do unnatural things to get there. Personally, I would not want a tightrope walk between two hot air balloons. And if you look at the guys, they're like, oh, yeah, do it, Joe. You can do this. This is really cool. Go. And the other guys, yeah, come. You can do this. But somebody's got to step out there and do it. And that's hard. So back in 1991, there was a book called Crossing the Chasm. And it's talking about the early adopters, the people who really want things to happen. They buy into it. And everybody has a smartphone. When they first came out, it was kind of a fad. But now everybody's got one. So think about that. Think about how, how Linux has made the transition. Now OpenStack is making the transition. This third platform is making the transition. But somebody's got to step out under that tightrope walk and do the walk. And it's not easy. So as you start to think about it, what are those unnatural or crazy things that you're being asked to do? How do I navigate that chaos that's called the IT department? How is that different from the, the traditional things that I've done in the past? It's a different world. It's a different set of um, requirements. So I think uh, Cisco, John Chambers, uh, he had a great comment. When companies and countries go digital, IT becomes a board-level concern. Now think about that. A board-level concern means it matters to them about how I do things. 
Not necessarily how great that application is. Is it the best one out there? But these are things about running my business, making business critical stay up and on time. So we did a, a, a little engagement with ESG, and, and they did some work. So the right side of the chart is the actual data. The left side is the summary, because it's easier to read. But if you look up there between total cost of ownership, price, features, et cetera, innovation is not number one. It's not number two. It's not number nine. IT shops are really worried about a few things. They want to, they're very traditional, very safe people. Think of your insurance salesman, right? They want to know that things are going to work, and they want to know they're going to work consistently in the same. So this ESG paper is going to be posted here, hopefully within a month or two, but it, it really brings out the idea that cost, price, features, vendor relationship, it's in there. There are customers that we have from a NetApp perspective that they stop buying spinning disks. They're only buying flash and they're repurposing things. They've got gear. They want to know what to do with it. They want to know that when I'm doing an upgrade or when I'm doing a patch, that it's going to work. So think about that as you're trying to navigate that, um, that move from kind of a proof of concept into the mainstream enterprise. I have a new set of suitors that I have to go convince to use my application. So it's, it's a different world. And the way I look at it, there's really two options to take. There's the roll your own kind. Really cool. I've got a bunch of smart guys that create something. And they're doing it with a bunch of white box servers. And historically, that was my job in a previous company, building white box servers. Love the concept, love the theory, but it does have limitations. So a white box server with a bunch of disks under it, you can start to build things, and you look really smart. I'm taking advantage of this new world, this new architecture, but I do have a few limitations. I've got a few extra things to, uh, to, to learn. Then there's the version of enterprise DAS, or enterprise direct attached storage. So I'm going to marry the two ideas, and I'm still going to do them both in the OpenStack or open source construct. And so whether it's you pick your flavor, but I can take those disks and, and create a different world that has a built-in data protection. And you can pick your data protection type. You can use uh, your EMC version, your NetApp version, your XYZ version. You can use erasure coding. Um, you can use whatever flavor, but there's a level of built-in data protection that's not replication. It's, it's been kind of hashed out for years. No single point of failure, purpose-built hardware. Next one would be, what about performance and protection beyond hardware? So predictive drive failures. What is my drive doing? This drive's kind of showing up a little bit slow every once in a while. Maybe I need to replicate the data or evacuate the data off of that drive. There are things that the enterprise storage is going to bring that is not yet there in the, in the community. So we're going to talk about that theory and say, all right, Scott, give me some proof points. Give me some value that says that this isn't just a really cool marketing pitch to make EMC or NetApp or HDS or somebody else um, have a reason to be here. So we've got an example here. We took a, a stack of white boxes, so fat servers, and we made a Swift cluster. So fat servers have the CPU, the memory, the networking, the storage disks. They have all these things together. And as I need more, I just stack another one. It's a pretty cool concept. It does have some limitations, though. When you look at it from a, an enterprise DAS perspective, you have an HA pair, and you can start to look at no single point of failure. You have things like... Uh, compute network and storage that I can scale independently. I can do the value of I need more CPU, I need more networking, or I need more storage, and, and buy the right components in the lower, lowest level of common denominator there independently. I also get no single point of failure, so the design in the box is for HA, or high availability. I mentioned the uh, features that are protecting you beyond just the hardware failures. You can do things that are predictive drive failures and more data um, now analytics there. You also get better serviceability. When the drive fails, the uh, enterprise storage system will tell you which drive it is. And, and by the way, a disk is probably being sent to you. And there's a cost to that. And there's a cost to it. But we're, we're going to look at some of the, the other things I do get. I get things like density. Because I'm using a different level of data, data protection, I can use higher density. I can use fewer copies. I also get, uh, in this case, I went from 10 2U servers to one, or two 1U servers. So I went to a thin server 
uh, architecture on the right, and then I put the external storage underneath it. So we get a lower um, footprint, a uh, better carbon footprint on the, uh, the right side. I also have a lower total cost of ownership, and I'm going to show you some details on that in the, in the next slide. But I also have about a 20 to 50 percent reduction in disk footprint. And how do you do that? Well, you have to pick your favorite flavor of data protection. And that, again, could be leveraging some existing infrastructure or your, your NetApp and EMC or Hitachi or whatever flavor, or you buy into Crush, or you buy into Striping, or you buy into something else. Using different schemes allow you to meet different objectives. Okay, so we are going to talk about cost. So if I asked you what is the most expensive cost storage to deploy, what's the answer? Fiber channel SAN. Fiber channel SAN. That'd be EMC, right? No? <laughs> Leaders in the fiber channel SAN. You'd think it would be external storage, wouldn't it? So we did some work, and we started to look at it. And actually, it depends on how you do your replication layers. So if you do a one-layer replication, you know, 1x high availability, I'm going to buy into NetApp or EMC or some high availability storage, that's the blue line on the right. It's really low cost. It might cost, or sorry, yeah, low one on the right. It costs a little bit on your, your acquisition cost, but over time, it's actually pretty cheap. Not a lot of people want to put everything on one copy. So what if I go to two copies? That's the uh, red line. High availability, two copies. And what we did is we compared with the JBODs or Whitebox. Now, Whitebox had a really, really good um, initial acquisition cost, my CapEx cost. But over five years, that green bar continues to grow because there's more cost in, in associated with higher number of server count, higher footprint, more network traffic, more uh, disk failures. So there's a lot of things that go into this, everything from bodies. What does it cost to have my people on the floor doing this? To things like, what's my power, my, my rack space? Everything that we could think of throwing in there, we threw in there. And this is not including the uh, software stacks on top. But this is maintenance and, and the whole thing. So it's important to note that as you start to look at the, um, the total cost, the things that your number one or number two on your uh, IT shop they care about is your total cost. Question? Do we do? Because this case tied for 192 terabytes. And this comparison, are you compared to comparison for usable? It's usable, right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, it is usable. Yes. Usable. And in this case, uh, when you compare uh, 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 JBO, or let's say, what type of data you compare? Is it like single copy of data, double copy of data? This is a three replication copy, of, and I think we used Swift in this example, wasn't it? So it's three copies of Swift versus two copies of enterprise storage. So you pretty much compare not 192 terabytes of JPOD, but you're comparing like roughly 576 terabytes of storage. You're, copy, you're looking at 192 with usable replicated twice versus 192 usable replicated three times. Yeah, it's two versus three. Yeah. Okay? Yes. You would do replication on the JBOD. We would use high availability mirrored or high availability with two copies on the uh, enterprise DAS. Okay? okay? Yep. All right. So with that, you use the term erasure coding. Everybody thinks they have their favorite tool. It's usually a hammer, and everything looks like a nail. I've got a white box. I've got this. I've got... Cluster data on tap, I've got VMAX, I've got XYZ. So everything looks like the one thing I can do, and I can hit it with a hammer. IT shops don't really care about just a hammer. They want to know that we have a tool belt. And sometimes I need a screwdriver. Sometimes I need to do things a little bit differently. So as you're starting to look at your proof of concept into the other application or into a, a DevOps environment, what are the tools required? And it might be reliability. It might be footprint or power or something else. So keep in mind that we have to look at more than just a hammer. We have to look at all the different tools that are going to get us to a deployment. Okay, 
So standard white box replication, I believe Matt's going to share a few ideas on, on how that application works. Thank you, Scott. So really, when we start with this, so again, we've got these three servers. And in this case, we have uh, JBODs uh, underneath them. But they're dedicated JBODs uh, to each one to each server. But in order to actually connect them, we're using high performance Ethernet. Um, originally, we started with 1 gig. Now we've moved to 10. And you can see that the, the, each of these servers has the, the same components in it. So I have CPUs, I have RAM, and I have disks. Well, in this case, when we have a disk that fails, well, first of all, when we have I.O., we, we want to copy it in multiple places to make sure it's there. But when we have a disk that fails, we have to resilver from somewhere else. Um, and when we have to do that, there's a, a huge tax because, one, I'm using this data network. And really, the goal of that data network should be just to write data or to read data. But now I'm having to suck up a significant portion of it for reconstruction. So I'm potentially impacting. Uh, the performance, the read-write performance, be while I'm resilvering. And the time to actually fully copy some of these drives, especially at six terabytes, isn't measured in minutes. It's not measured in hours. It's measured in days. So this is a, a real non-trivial process to actually rebuild that. Well, what does it look like? Um, and, and again, not only are we abusing the network, sorry there, uh, we're also abusing the CPU and the RAM. I need places to store that data. I have to take CPU overhead to handle all of the I.O. So again, other ways that are going to degrade the overall performance, provide an inconsistent performance footprint for the environment. Well, when we look at it and just have two servers and two copies, we have the same thing. Now, in this particular case, um, we're going to use a, a standard RAID level, say, five or six, and, and we do have a hot spare. Now, we have multiple different types of RAID technologies. Everyone in here that's been exposed to it, um, whoa. <laughs> There we go. I'm just making sure everyone's awake. <laughs> Excellent. So again, in this case, this is just looking at it with a traditional RAID level. Um, but there's multiple different ways to do it. We actually have an implementation of Crush with RAID 6. We call it dynamic disk pools. It allows us to, to grow and be uh, flexible. And in order, uh, there's gives and gets with that type of technology for us. We have a, a lower write performance envelope. However, when we have a media failure, it, we have a significantly less uh, impact during rebuild to RIO. And uh, at the same time, we can rebuild faster. But in this case, let's just assume I've got RAID 5 or 6 with um, a regular, regular situation. We've got IO. I lose a disk. Well, now I'm going to spend time inside the box recreating that data. Now, that was completely transparent to the application environment. I'm still getting the benefits that we'd have, say, in a Swift environment. I've got two copies here, so I'm able to balance them across the two servers. I've got dual proxies for dual interface. But when we have the simple case of just a media failure, instead of having to burden the entire system with copying over the primary network, I can reconstruct the data underneath the covers. Um, when we talk to our most IT managers, one of the things we find, especially storage admins, well, actually, application admins more so, they really don't like yellow indicators on things. So we looked at some very large-scale Swift deployments. And one of the things that we found is that some of our larger customers actually have stated that 50% of their data is in flight at any time because it's being recopied, because they have thousands of disks, and they're serial ATA disks. They're not enterprise uh, serial attached SCSI disks. So it's amazing that we have to have all of this data flying around, independent of even bringing new data into the cluster in and of itself. Well, in our case, this is completely transparent. The application says it's in a healthy state. Uh, we'll get an actual air light that will show up, which is something you don't get on your white box, typically. Um, if you've got our auto support technology or auto report home, phone home, most enterprise products do, uh, a drive will show up, and a drone will simply replace the drive, and this will happen. And, that, and this will go back to fully normal, and that'll be repurposed as a spare. But it didn't impact the application at all. It was completely transparent. At the same time, though, I'm still getting to maintain all of the good benefits, because while I can scale vertically and add more disks, I get the horizontal infinite scale because I can just add more servers with more enterprise storage underneath it. 
So we refer to it as a better together story. So what I'd like to talk about for a couple minutes is, is how we actually proved this out. So when we started looking at this a while ago, uh, our folks inside of our team that uh, were working with OpenStack, and NetApp was one of the founders of OpenStack, had come to us and said, we think this Swift thing could work on E-Series, but you know, we don't know, but let's test it out. And so we tested in our lab and it, and it worked. And so we started talking about it. And it turns out that a, a customer, um, our field team came to us with a customer, the University of Melbourne. In Australia, they actually have a federal mandate to have research clusters available countrywide. And so if you think about it, you know, you've got millions of people that want to have access to infinitely scaled storage and compute resources. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to make sure that they had the most reliable implementation of this that they possibly could. And so they're like, hey, we saw that you guys said you could use Swift on top of enterprise storage. You know, tell us more. And I'm like, well, here's what we know. Here's what we've tested. I haven't really put this out in the field yet, um, but it looks good. The cost numbers look really good. The performance is good. We, we simulated some failures. And they're like, well, why don't you come down to Australia and talk to, talk to University of Melbourne about this? And I was like, well, hold on. Who's, who's actually going to manage their OpenStack environment for them? And they're like, well, they have a partner, Aptera. So I'm like, let's talk to Aptera, because what was more important was understanding the person that was actually going to have to set up, deploy, manage, deal with all of the day-to-day -day headaches that they understood this opportunity, this implementation, and the differences in whether it made sense. And when we met with the partner, Aptera, they actually... At first, we're a little bit like, well, wait a minute, isn't, you're, you're talking about these things we're not, we don't talk about in white box. We're talking about RAID and you know, high availability and redundant controllers and fans and proprietary hardware and all of these things that we, you know, like we're not supposed to really do that. But we went through the value prop. As it turns out, uh, folks in the, at Aptera had actually used E-Series for a, a more traditional database deployment. And so we had a couple conversations, and they, they really got behind it. And in fact, we deployed a, a two petabyte Swift cluster with them. And actually, we have almost four petabytes on the floor there because we have Cinder as well uh, on one of our other platforms. And we're looking at another four petabytes um, for other scale object and block storage with them because the first deployment worked out so well. Uh, they've got information on this, on the project, essentially up on uh, their website. Aptera has also published this as a case study on their website. So we were very, this was very exciting because all of these different things that we've talked about really about the proven reliability, the fact that customers know. I mean, in our case, we've sold almost a million units of this particular platform. And so there's not really a question of whether or not our technology works. It's will it perform and deliver in this particular environment? And what are the sacrifices or challenges with it? And what we found is that it's better together. So we're very excited about it. Now, is two to, you know, two to 10 petabytes the largest sort of thing you're going to see? No, not really. I mean, it's in object storage land. It's pretty much the base. But it's a great starting point. And it's really about how you can repurpose or bring in enterprise expertise that are aligned. Aptera had a whole bunch of storage admins that already knew how to use enterprise storage. And so instead of having to get a new DevOps team or train up people to do the white box disk problems, they were able to use their existing resources. It saved the partner money because they're managing it too. I think Scott wants to come and talk about another use case. So as we uh, keep going here, any questions on the case study or the, the concept of the enterprise storage in this environment yet? All right. Have you never... guys uh, tried on your standard NAS or just on E-series? So what was the Have we part? tried it on FAS as well as E-Series? Well. Yeah, so uh, you, you certainly can, I mean, that's what's beautiful about having software-defined storage. You absolutely could run it on top of FAS. But here's the challenge that you have with that is that Swift is doing the replication. Swift is doing the load balancing. Well, cluster data on tap does all of those things for us. So you would be essentially over-provisioning yourself. You would be buying a hardware technology, an integrated appliance platform technology, and then a software-defined, and then you're going to have to figure out how you want to split between those. The beautiful thing with E-Series is it's about reliability, performance, and scalability. And we really, really mesh well in an environment where application, where the data management layer is inside the application stack. So software-defined storage technologies are a fantastic fit for your classic 
block sand, block enterprise DAS environment. In fact, our heritage, we've been doing this for a long time. It's almost been 40 years. Um, but this platform that we sold almost a million of, we have the world's largest parallel file system installation of 200 petabytes running Lustre at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So this isn't the first time we've done it. It's the first time we've done it with object storage. But it's actually core to our DNA. Once we realized what actually was going on with Swift, and we sort of got over the allergic reaction of, ooh, that's white box stuff. We don't want to talk about it. And the white box guys got over, ooh, enterprise storage. We don't want to talk to you. All right, so I'm going to take that, that concept of enterprise storage, white box storage back and forth and bring in one more case study. In this case study, we had a, a customer that went um, to deploy an analytics uh, application. Pick your favorite one. They had theirs. But it was business intelligence, and they needed to do something in the uh, about 300 terabyte uh, space. And it was something that they really wanted to deploy with a direct attached storage. They wanted white box. The application vendor said, hey, you should do this on white box. And the POC guys, we want to do this on white box, but the people that had to support it and deploy it said, no, 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 we're going to go with enterprise storage. So there was a, a little bit of challenge there because which one do you follow? The, the guys who are receiving the, uh, the traditional Goliaths that make the, pay the checks or David who's coming in, I got something cool and I want to do it on white box. So we went with a... Enterprise DAS solution, in this case it's the E-Series uh, 5600 using a bunch of six terabyte drives and about 300 uh, terabytes per site usable. And it had complete DR. What was really cool about that is it, we won against Whitebox because we had better performance hands down. Now in our labs, we have actually tested a number of different open source solutions on our E-Series platforms. And, up to two and a half times better performance. Now, obviously, you have to tune and tweak and do things, but we got some pretty smart architects that are playing with this stuff, showing that we can actually do better performance, better reliability, and better uptime. Those are really important messages to an IT shop. They want to know, can I afford this, and will it, will it work in that environment? And if you put that cool app on top of enterprise gear, you get the best of both worlds, as Matt called it, the uh, better together. We thought about handing out Reese's Pieces to everybody to see if uh, that would make the story stick, but didn't want to get our fingers dirty. OK, the competitors here, HP, uh, HDS, and Cisco, you know, there's a lot of ways to go after this segment, but enterprise storage in that environment is going to give you the values and the support that you need to accelerate those applications in the new environments. All right, we're almost done, guys. Hang with us. So a little recap. Proof of concepts. Typically, I bring in something that's really simple. I've got low CapEx cost. I have my white box servers. Uh, I'm a Dell shop, HP shop, or whoever. And I'm going to deploy these new applications on top of that. I look, staying on the left, I look at a decentralized storage management. And it's OK if there's a little risk, because I got a bunch of smart guys who are going to help me get this deployed. Moving to the right side in an optimized for production environment, game changes. I've got people who are worried about upgrades, uptime. Is my network going to be there? Who's going to replace the disk? Who's going to do all these things if, I, if something doesn't work? What about zero day currency? So everything's cool on your side for your new app, but I also have something else running on that network. Are they compatible? Who's done that compatibility check? So it's really about TCO, lo amount of risk that you're willing to take. How do you take those cool things in with the least amount of risk? So I'm going to come back to my, my original fun slide. You guys walking across there, he's thinking, I'm going to make it. He's confident. He's got his little GoPro on his head, and everything's going to be great. Doesn't look too, uh, too bad, right? What's unique about what he's doing, though? He's, boo. He's wearing a parachute. Nobody's dumb enough to try to do that without a parachute. So what's your parachute? Is it enterprise storage in that environment? Do you have a plan? Because with an enterprise, with a, with a parachute, I might even try that. Don't try to go into an environment where you're not set up for success. And the community is eventually going to get there to help accelerate the adoption of applications. But today, we have things that are maybe a, a 2.5 platform, a mode 1.5, or whatever terminology you want. But a lot of those challenges of 
buying into the enterprise environment have been solved and the comfort is there. So get yourself into that environment, look at working with your uh, enterprise storage partners to solve some of those problems. And I think we're, we're done. Any questions before we uh, wrap up? Right here. Security, another big one. Back to the Cisco comment, right? When you're looking at a global environment, security of all my IT assets is a big deal. Yep. Other questions? Back, red shirt. Well, it depends on which application, which deployment. So we do have Cinder drivers for both the NetApp FAST side and the E-Series side. And, and depending on what your primary objectives are, is it performance or is it uh, scale? Do I need a certain replication engines? We will decide which uh, platform to recommend based on IT requirements. What, what would be some of the criteria that would Yeah, so um, I think some of the ones that are, that are critical, one of them Obvious cases where FAS absolutely shines is FAS's uh, data retention, uh, deduplication, snapshot, snap, replicate, mirror, uh, cluster technology is fantastic for virtual machine images. I mean, it, it is uh, absolutely, it, it's just a slam dunk to think of, of that. So when you have super critical data that absolutely has to be available at all cost and you want to just put it there and know that it's there and have it all managed on the back end, that, where that's where you would use FAS, but how much of the data is that super critical inside of an entire private cloud? Um, I think, you know, well, I mean, but so, so then with E-Series, it's a little, yeah. I mean, there are, so financial institutions, right? But I mean, when we talk about things like object storage uh, or, or actually other cases when you want persistent performance with scale, like if someone tells you they need uh, 100 terabytes uh, that they want to be able to persistently mount and have access to with multiple virtual machines. Again, E-Series with something like dynamic disk pools over iSCSI fabric uh, makes sense. Later this year, we're going to add fiber channel support for the E-Series, and then there's a whole conversation about slicing up uh, flash lens if you want to spin up database instances, for example, uh, over a fiber channel uh, cinder connection. Not, not so much, not so much availability. It's, it's with FAS, you get the opportunity to replicate, do your snapshots with no penalty. With E-Series, you're going to have different things. You'll have consistent performance. So as you're doing things like uh, mirroring or disk failures, that performance is persistent. It's consistent. It's expected. OK? Other questions? Right here. Did you get paid? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess uh, no. We no. Okay. <laughs> well, then we got to discount his comments then. I guess what I'm getting at, um, with what he's getting here is, and this is coming from a position of someone who's got both an awful lot of your stuff in E-Series and an awful lot of EMC stuff in several different things, including DNA, as well as consuming Swift and Cinder and the set containing many different forms. I suppose one of the things that is a little bit or left out of any of this is the fact that if you do roll things by yourself and you are doing things by yourself like many of the people at this conference do on a hyperscale, you have agility. One of the things that a large vendor can't necessarily bring to the table as a consequence of giving you security, stability, safety, a handhold and a parachute is that really, really quick sense of agility. Like there's people now who go, hey, can we put these things to set quick roll and production down? That's something that doesn't quite happen in the enterprise. So, uh, so I guess can, I'm philosophically, philosophically I, here, here's my response. So philosophically, you mentioned the term um, agility and hyperscale. Hyperscalers can typically buy a whole lot of engineering people, developers, to go do this. Most IT shops don't, and so they're more traditional. And you're going to bring that in and do, you want me to do what? Uh, what do I have to learn? But, but I've got all my, my scripts and all my stuff that works. And so you, you're really looking at the investment of does the developer, let's say you're a guy who developed that really cool thing and, and you want to go get it deployed. Do you go with the application to deploy it? Or are you going to have it so that it's deployable and that you can continue to develop? 
And that transition is something that a lot of developers need to think about. Hyperscalers, they can, they can afford that. They have that army. Service providers, hundreds of people. So, so are, you, are you suggesting that what the picture you've painted today is, is a place, is your, your play into that market, which you just mentioned, rather than a hyperscale market, or are you, are you in there too? We're in both. We do, uh, well, again, from an E-series perspective, not a product pitch, but we, we are part of the hyperscale solutions group, so we can scale there. But a lot of those partners will go through a business partner, an integration partner, or they have the resources to do it themselves. And if they can do it themselves, I'm a fantastic building block for them to shortcut a few of the other things that they don't want to have to go develop. Question. So, my name is Scott from EMC. Um, I want to kind of answer that question in, in direct alignment with what you're saying here, is that the presentation in no way limits your ability to deploy Swift, right? They're just we can be just the DAS underneath your data source deployment. In, in no way have, has enterprise storage limited your ability to deploy against the trunk of SWIFT. And actually, and we'd like it, to it, accelerate it because we are giving you security. We're, we're giving you security. We're going to give you data protection. We're going to give you those other features that say, all right, now I need to work on what is my number one concern with that new application. Deployment. And I would take it one step further, just as an example of, of taking this to the enterprise. One of the things, when we started this uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, everyone's like, well, Matt, FlexPod, where, where's the FlexPod version of, of all this stuff? And I'm like, wow, I am not selling to enterprise 100 accounts yet on this. This is something that we're responding to. We're being reactive to the market. Uh, and we're really taking our heritage and parallel file systems and, and moving it forward. Well, we actually are working on a, um, uh, a flex pod and it's going to have phases with a cinder target for critical data management and then we're going to actually because it's a, a blade a set of blade centers we're using iSCSI to connect to e-series in a sand fabric which if you told me a year and a half ago that we'd actually have any implementations that we're sand I would have it was mind-blowing to me that that we get we're getting there but that's because Cisco NetApp uh, and, and Red Hat see the value in it because we have customers that are asking for deployable rack infrastructure based on all tier one proven enterprise hardware. And I suppose that's kind of what I was getting at before was that, that concept of less agility but stability. You have, it's as if it's baked clients, right? Well, but I mean, it's a reference architecture and, and so that's the less agility is the only part that I would disagree with uh, about it because I think in some ways it's faster because if my IT people already know how to manage Cisco UCS servers, Nexus class switches, and E-Series uh, enterprise SAN DAS configurations, then that's like, and they don't have to learn how to deal with white box. Like, I can actually get this to happen faster. And so we're not saying it's a one-size-fits-all approach. We can scale in a lot of directions. And in fact, our own object platform, Storage Grid Web Scale, which scales over to 70 petabytes in 16 locations with geo-distributed erasure coding, uses hierarchical erasure coding, running E-Series as the data protection underneath it. So I mean, there are, we can take this in almost any direction, but it's really been about being able to adapt and respond to customers that have questions that already have these existing skill sets and determining how they can get the benefits of DevOps, of elasticity, while still maintaining some of that core value set that they already know how to do to accelerate deployment. All right, guys, we've got one minute. Any other last questions? All right, thank you very much for joining, and if you have any comments, we'll be around for a few minutes. Thank you.